Let's see. Well, today's talk, as you know, is about Charles uh, Rennie uh, McIntosh, whose 150th birthday was last year. So a little bit late, belated birthday greetings to uh, him. And Diane brought a special uh, treat for everybody that I guess we'll have after the talk. So um, if, uh, just to give you a sense of Diane's background, she, you've spoken here before, I think. So some of you may remember Diane uh, in the past. Anyway, she's, she's born in Cleveland, got her uh, undergraduate degree at UCLA, her master's at Berkeley, and her PhD in architectural history at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, before she became a professor here, she was a uh, architectural historian for the uh, Caltrans for 20 years. I said, did you write a history of Caltrans? She said she got going on it, but didn't quite finish it. So that's something that somebody should do someday. Right? Um, and she came to San Diego in 1994 to be, become a senior planner in San Diego planning department. Uh, retired in 2007. Uh, and she's a professor at, um, well, you speak at, at San Diego State and everywhere. She's an all purpose <laughs> architectural historian uh, in San Diego. She work, lives in La Jolla with her husband, John. And um, just to give you a little intro to mm -hmm. uh, Macintosh, I looked up famous quotes that he's made. You may use one of these, but the one I found that's they always put on about him says, life is the leaves which shape and nourish a plant, but art is the flower which embodies its meaning. So we hear a lot about art and flowers and architecture from Diane King. So welcome, Diane. Thank you, Roger. Well, I'm I'm amazed by the turnout. I thought nobody's going to come to this. What does it have to do with San Diego? So I'm going to throw a question back to you right now that you could think about as I am going through this uh, talk. What does this have to do with San Diego? Um, this lecture started about a year ago. I was approached by an Osher uh, group in San Diego County to give a talk on Charles Rennie McIntosh's 150th birthday. And I thought, how fun. I would love to do this. So I <coughs> studiously put the talk together. And the, the, on the propitious day, I wound up on the wrong campus. <laughs> so I never got to give the talk. <laughs> so I thank you for giving me an audience so I could do this. But in the interim, I did all of this work on Macintosh. And I got so interested in seeing what has happened since I was a student at the University of Edinburgh in my junior year abroad. Mm -hmm. I did spend some time in Glasgow. And at the at Edinburgh Festival, the year I was at, at school there, they did the first retrospective of Charles Rennie McIntosh since he had died in 1928. So this was 1968, 40 years later there had been almost nothing done on him. So I did see the retrospective. He was kind of rediscovered at that point. And since then, it's been very <clears throat> interesting and remarkable to see how his reputation has flourished. Uh, anybody been to Glasgow lately? Anybody see the Macintosh stuff? I see a couple, couple of smiles here. Well. I got so interested that I needed to do a layover between San Diego and Africa this summer, and I did it in Scotland. And I spent several days in Glasgow doing a Macintosh pilgrimage. So you will now have the benefit of not only my earlier research, but my pilgrimage research that I can share with you. And I want you to start thinking about what we might be able to do here in San Diego for our local boy, Irving Gill, that they have already done for Charles Reddy McIntosh in Glasgow. So I think you're going to see a lot of parallels between the two and the two cities as well. So put your thinking cap on, and we'll have a really interesting conversation at the end of the lecture with the cake, with the cake. And, and get your, your singing voice going. We are going to sing, and we have <laughs> candles, which may be lit if the fire marshal will let us. Okay. 
in Scottish, singing in Scottish. <laughs> I, I can see some people here who can do that. Okay. All right. So let's get started here. We don't know a lot about Mr. McIntosh's early life. His history pretty much picks up when he starts as an apprentice at the firm of Honeyman and Kepi, which is one of the larger architectural firms in Glasgow in the early, um, early 1990s. And at the architecture firm, he meets up with this fellow right here, uh, James Herbert McNair. So the two of them meet at the office. They're both entry-level draftsmen. And they begin taking classes at the Glasgow School of Art, which they are taking night classes. They're working during the day. Now, during the day, people taking those classes are these two ladies down here, Margaret MacDonald, who later becomes Charles' wife, and Frances MacDonald, her sister, who marries James McNair. So this is, this is all very cozy. They get along famously, they hang out together, they do shows together, and they become titled The Four. So this is the burgeoning modern movement in Glasgow, Scotland in the late 1890s. Okay, so this is, how do I advance this? The arrows are not working. Should I try it down now? Space bar. Ah, space bar, excellent. Okay, so I'll give you a brief overview of his life and then we can start looking at his work. So he starts off working for Honeyman and Kepi. He also attends classes at the School of Art in Glasgow and in 1900 he gets the Alexander Greek Thompson Traveling Scholarship. So he is considered their top student. He does some touring, does some sketching, uh, expands his horizons, and eventually makes connection with successionists in both Vienna and in Turin, Italy. So through those connections, he begins exhibiting in their avant-garde uh, programs and becomes well known on the continent, although in Glasgow, he's not well known at all. And, and in England, nobody has a clue of who he is. He's, down, he's up in Scotland, up in the, the highlands and the mists of Scotland. So that's how he winds up getting well known on the continent before he's known at home. Uh, he, gets, he becomes a fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects uh, about 10 years later. He's also a member of the Glasgow Institute of Architects and has a fairly brief and spectacular career from about 1895 to 1905. That's when his most productive period is. And when I looked at his age, he was he's between his late 20s and mid to late 30s. Not sure what happens. He kind of fizzles out. So by the time he's 50, he com he's completely fed up with architecture. He stops doing architecture and begins doing textile design first, and then he goes into painting. So he spends the last several years of his life in southern France, partially because his health declines. So he's there for the, uh, the climate. And he does sort of the Cezanne thing, starts painting landscapes inspired by the, uh, the topography and uh, ocean seascapes of southern France. Uh, and then he dies in 1928 in obscurity. So that's the arc of his life. Okay, so where is his stuff? I'll tell you, I'll give a little bit of context. Here's, Gla here's downtown Glasgow, a lot of his material is still extant and it's clustered within about a 20 minute uh, quadrangle. So you can walk to a lot of the major stuff. Uh, here's the Glasgow train station. So that's, this we're in the industrial era. Glasgow is a major port town and they are a high, uh, a highly, um, I would say, um, productive uh, nucleus for the industrial revelation, rev revelation? revolution. So they have a lot of foundries, a lot of heavy businesses, they have a port, they're doing shipping, and a lot of the craftsmen 
who are working in these industrial uh, capacities are being hired by him to do his iron work, to do his glass work, to make his furniture designs. So Glasgow has a lot of very highly skilled craftsmen who are we're sort of coming out of the arts and crafts period. They're, they're doing some exquisite work by hand and also some very high quality machine work. So that's how he's able to produce a lot of the materials that he designs. So he starts off when he's at Honeyman and Kepi and he gets some very large scale projects. Two of his earliest ones are for newspaper magnets. So he does both the daily record building for one newspaper and he does another, uh, this is now called the Lighthouse, but this is the other um, newspaper in town. They are, I think I can talk about yeah, Yes, yeah, okay, okay. Um, so we've got two newspaper offices fairly close to the train station. I'll show you what they look like. They're very hard to photograph because they're on side streets. So you can't really get a long view and they get a lot of shady shadow on them. But they're, uh, they're both extant. Uh, here is, I can't read this. Uh, we've got a school up here. Here's the, the cathedral and the uh, town graveyard. This is up on a hill, so he does a school over here. We've got the Willow, which is his famous, one of his famous tea rooms. We'll talk about some more. Uh, the Glasgow School of Art, which is right uphill from the tea room, and the Glasgow Art Club. So these are all within about a 20 minute walking area. There's a pedestrian mall that goes from the train station up to this cross town pedestrian mall, and must, a lot of these, these Macintosh properties are right along there. Uh, if we go a little further out, we've got the University of Glasgow. His first home with his wife uh, was actually an apartment that they gutted and then did all of the interiors. And they used it as a showroom for their designs. So it's filled with their furnishings, with their stained glass, with her tapestries and needlework, and with light fixtures. Turns out that Charles Rennie Macintosh was fascinated by electricity and the light bulb. So he did a ton of designs for electrical lights. And he loved the bulb. So these are highly exposed. I'll show you a number of his, of, of his fixtures, but his apartment had a gazillion lighting designs that he could show clients, this is what I can do for you. He also had a number of chair designs and other types of furniture that was very sleek and modern. And they painted everything white. So that was to give a nice backdrop for all of these uh, arts and crafts items. The other aspect of white, other than being clean, is he was colorblind. He had no idea what colors he was looking at. So if you look at what he did, stuff's either black or it's white. The colorist in the household was his wife. So anything that has color on it is her contribution. And in fact, the two of them worked very closely together to the point that it's really difficult to see where one's influence ended and the other began. So I would really say it's a team. She gets very little recognition in the architectural press, of course, but he really needed her and she needed him. And I think what you're seeing is the combined creative output of their teamwork. So, so back, back to the University of Glasgow, their first apartment was on a piece of land that the university bought and needed for expansion. So the building was demolished, but they retained all of the interiors and recreated it as a wing of the art museum. So you can now go over there to the art museum and see a special exhibition that is a recreation of their interiors. So that's out here. Uh, here's another school. We'll talk about that one a little later. So we've got a school out here and we've got a school here. We've got the Glasgow School of Art. If we go a little further afield, uh, we have a, a house for an art lover, which was built in a city park. That's out here. 
um, and another church will look at. This was out in a, a suburban area of Glasgow at the time it was built, and a parsonage for another church that's even further out. These are located, you can see a blue streak here. Those are located along a canal that was used for the Industrial Revolution, bringing goods into downtown Glasgow and for shipping out. Now, if you look even further afield, these are a number of projects in Scotland and Northern Ireland that have been researched recently, and there is some information on them. There's a very good bibliography. If you go on the Friends of Macintosh website, they have done an excellent job of, of scanning all of this stuff and putting it up there. But a lot of it is just fragmentary stuff. Not sure how much of this got built or what sort of shape it's in. But it, it, opposed to what we're going to look at here, he had much wider production there that we really have a good handle on. What I, didn't, what I don't have there is Southern England. When he moves to London later in his career, there are a number of projects in the London area also. So his, his production is further afield than you would think. Okay, so he starts off as the enfant terrible at the Glasgow School of Art by doing poster design. And clearly, one of his, his influences is Aubrey Beardsley. So you can see his poster on the right. This was in 1895. The Aubrey Beardsley Salome is a year earlier. <clears throat> and this has gotten some interesting commentary, his poster, as to what is, what is this? So the, the interpretation is it's a woman, at least it's her head, in a stockade, but you know, are these arms? Are they floral pieces? They, we have some linear elements here. Someone looked at this as marine creatures, like uh, something floating in the ocean. We have some spiky things here. This has been interpreted as breasts. <laughs> To me, they, they look more like a spiky artichoke or something, but clearly he's, he's morphing natural elements and human elements, elements and some highly stylized design to create a very enigmatic image. And so he starts off with poster design. He's certainly being influenced by Aubrey Beardsley. Uh, as we get, in, we get into his work, he's looking at William Morris and the tail end of the arts and crafts. Uh, some, a lot of the imagery in the paintings are coming out of the Raphaelites. And a lot of furnishings are highly allied with the aesthetic movement. So we're going to be seeing influence from Japan, as well as the Middle Ages, and um, these various characters. His style is highly recognizable. It's very linear. And a, a lot of that flatness and linearity is probably coming out of Japan. Uh, we're going to have these very odd figures. They makes you wonder what they were smoking or drinking <laughs> when you look at some of these features. Again, very limited color palette, which we described. Uh, and then a lot of imagery being taken from nature, plant forms in particular. Uh, they were very fond of the rose and of heart-shaped leaves. So the, the rose is, it's very like English rose, Scottish rose. There, there are some fairy tales that were very popular with the arts and crafts movement uh, around the, the term the briar rose, sleeping beauty. So these were popular themes of the day. Here's a, a poster in the middle here with uh, Macintosh uh, in th about the same period. And I'm comparing him now to Alphonse Mucha and some of the posters being done in Paris for Sarah Bernhardt. So in contrast to these more florid uh, depictions, this is highly stylized, very flat, very linear, very reduced color palette. Here's their, uh, their room for the Vienna Succession in um, 1901. These are just set pieces, and they're trying to get people interested in modern design. So we have a wall, a tableau. Here's one of Margaret's paintings up here. Uh, and then 
uh, some sort of buttressy elements here that are fairly perforated, a very attenuated chair, and um, some metalwork. And then we also have a cabinet and with some very interesting doors. This motif is going to show up in a lot of his work. These are two birds in profile facing one another. They're called a, a dost birds. These, these elements here might be extended wings that have sort of been stretched out. So if you think of, of their design, they're doing a lot of Gumby type stuff where they take one element and then they stretch it and make it long and linear. This is in Turin the following year, another set piece. Look at the light fixtures. They, they love suspending these things from ceilings. We've got these high Victorian ceilings. If you think about it, they're just doing interiors. So they've got maybe you know, 12, 15 foot ceilings. They're extending the lights down and then coming up with these very fanciful globes that surround the light bulb. Uh, we're putting a dado in here. Again, white, limiting the color palette. Here's our painting with Margaret and some furniture with very tall back chairs. This was part of their strategy to create intimate spaces within large rooms. So the chair design is very much part of how they organize space and how they help facilitate in human interaction. It works beautifully in the tea rooms. I, I was trying to find a catalog of all the chair designs they did. They did a lot. And it never repeated themselves. They sort of do a theme and variation, but we see a lot of chairs. Uh, here's some de uh, decorative elements from the same exhibition. We have uh, roses here. Now here's Aubrey Birds Beardsley again. And the theme of this painting is Venus between terminal gods. Very fussy. So the, the main figure is quite flat and uh, uh, you know, fairly um, simple form, but the background is very fussy. By, by contrast, look at what's happened here. It's highly linear and uh, stretched out again and very colorful. These become stencil designs. So one of the other crafts that they're working with is wall stenciling. And we'll see this repeated over and over again, quite most frequently in pink with a little bit of green. This is the cover for a, uh, a competition that was sponsored by a German interior design magazine. So we'll look first at the cover. You can see the circular elements here coming in. There are actually three women's heads in there. You can't quite make it out. We have one woman here frontally positioned, one in profile, and another in profile looking up. And then their bodies just kind of evaporate into lines. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on there. Very similar to what's happening in these designs. Oops. So I go back now. I just blew it. Okay. Um, here's some of Margaret's paintings. These were taken from, these are now in um, the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, so you can see them. A lot of their decorative material are in museum collections, and you can see them. There's a very nice one in the uh, museum in Glasgow. So uh, again, a this is called the Wasail, sort of medievally themed uh, topics. Two women facing one another, uh, flanked by other pairs of women. Highly linear, very stripped background, and just splotches of color. This is the companion piece. These would have been hung up high on walls facing one another in a room to help create the sense of space and, and even the walls out. So they have completely white rooms and they're doing splashes of color with these decorative designs. She's also adding in textiles. So they did a lot of uh, narrow banners that are highly colored in the same uh, palette. But then the room itself is completely white. And then he has some rooms that are just black 
So he's, he's working with this black and white palette and she's adding all the decor. Here's how she did it. This is just a flat board and she starts building up a texture with gesso. Once she's got it where she wants it, she starts sketching in the, the linear design. And then she put the gesso in a pastry tube and applied it on the canvas as though she were decorating a cake. Now, only a woman would come up with this. <laughs> then uh, she's, got little, she's got some relief here. She's got little dots. And then they would take semi-precious stones and put them in the gesso and have the gesso, have them dry in the gesso. So today we might use white glue from a, a craft uh, boutique. But she's using gesso. And then when she gets it where she wants it, then she adds the color. So you can't quite see this detail in a lot of the paintings that I'm showing you, but they're all highly three-dimensional and exquisitely uh, produced. Another uh, project from 1901, they're, they're really getting into the international competition, international scene. This was another uh, hypothetical project for an artist's studio and cottage. There, you can see a very simple outline, uh, just a hint of a gable, very tall linear chimney. The decor is around the door, focusing on that. And here's the side view and a very small floor plan. And they even did a model. Now, when I looked at this, anybody know where this came from? Does this look familiar to anyone? Irving Gill? No. no. The, Irving Gill wasn't doing this in 1901. But, anybody been there? Anybody been to Taos Pueblo? Yes. That's the church at Taos Pueblo. So, the minute I saw this, I'm going like, this is where he got it. So do I know this for sure? No, I don't. But this is one of these things that he is looking at the same sources that Irving Gill is looking at. Now, I started thinking, how would he have known about this? Well, you have, you have the train coming out. You've got, I, I was trying to find out the dates Georgia O'Keeffe is in Taos and starts popularizing that. But it would have been published. We, there was, we have Charles Lummis, who walks across the United States in the Southwest and heavily publicizes it, so it's highly probable that he would have seen it. So, so where is he getting the idea for these flat linear forms? I think he's getting it here out of American Southwest Adobe, the same source Urban Gill is using. But he's looking here at San Diego. It's still all the, the latent Spanish stuff. Now, that was a project that was never built or at least it wasn't built until 1992. So a, a patron got inspired and built it in the north of Scotland. So this is how it came out. These uh, images were taken from a, um, a real estate brochure the last time it was on the market. You can actually Google this and see the little video that was produced for it. So it looks a lot like the drawings. and. Uh, you can see the, the flat walls here, the very linear, planar aspect. Since it's a house for an art lover, you've got the north-facing studio windows up on the top floor, uh, this beautiful curvilinear uh, window with the stained glass in the, in the uh, living room, and you know, this is very simple design, all enclosed in a courtyard. Good work here in San Diego, big thing. Okay, some designs from the early uh, 20th century, a chair design and a design for a cabinet. And these, these things are constantly recycled and reused in many different formats, many different materials. Metalwork. Now, Francis and, and um, Margaret are at the art school, and at this point, women are not allowed to do architecture. So they can do womanly crafts, which is basically textiles, but they also let them do metalwork. 
So they are doing metalwork designs, and you can see the same themes showing up in beaten metal and repoussé, uh, as we saw in, in the paintings. For architecture, one of the questions for architects in the late 19th century is how do we move toward modernism? What is modern and how do we get there? The interesting thing is throughout the entire 19th century, buildings are getting more modern on the inside. So we're adding in plumbing, we're adding in gas, we're adding in various types of home improvement projects, we're adding in electricity by the end of the this, of this century. But the homes on the outside still look traditional. So there's this wonderful dichotomy. If you, if you pay any attention to the Bauhaus, it's like the outside of the building has to set you up for the inside of the building. And all of this 19th century stuff is totally debased because it was historically um, referenced, referencing historical models. So I, I will posit, Ruben Gill did this, and I'm seeing Macintosh doing this. They're starting with the vernacular buildings of their own cultures, which are simpler, simply because the average person can't afford to do all the decoration. They can't afford all the color. So they are going to be simpler. So they start there, and they begin peeling off layers. So Macintosh starts with what's called Scottish baronial style. Now, before I spent my pilgrimage in Glasgow, I spent about a week in Edinburgh and was totally surprised to find out that Edinburgh has more historic buildings than any other city in Great Britain. It has something like two-thirds of the city is designated historic. So I saw a lot of Scottish colonial buildings. So if you want to know where he was getting his ideas, he could have been traveling in the Highlands, but he could have just gone to Edinburgh and gotten a lot of, of ideas that way. So here's Scottish baronial 19th century. You can see the crow step gables, uh, the slate roofs. We're banking our windows here, some ornamentation, semi-Gothic. And these, these are taking design hints from John Ruskin, who was the major uh, thought, thought leader in aesthetics in the latter half of the 19th century. Anybody try to read Ruskin? <laughs> I, I, I seriously, I tried when I was in graduate school. The only one I could get through was Seven Lamps of Architecture. I found Stones of Venice incomprehensible. I don't know what he was talking about. But this is pretty, pretty um, simple. These are the various aspects of, of guidance that would make great architecture. And everybody who was anybody read Ruskin, not just the architects, it was the average person. He was, he was highly influential. So people, he gave people um, a framework within which to judge the built environment. So when they're seeing new buildings coming online, they're checking the boxes. What did John say about this feature and that feature, whatever. So what are we looking at here? Truth. What does truth mean in terms of architecture? Don't all, don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> honesty, we've got honesty. Be, well, we got honesty here. Honesty was honesty in construction. No sham construction. Build it the way, you know, make it look the way it was built. Memory, history, honor history, sacrifice. Spend a lot of money on your buildings <laughs> till it hurts. <laughs> Power. The building needs to look strong, it needs to look masculine, like it's going to be there forever and ever. Uh, life, that's where all the vegetal ornamentation comes in. We want something springy and lifelike that's going to look as though it's fresh and uh, sprouting with energy. Beauty, we want beauty in our buildings. Of course we do. It's part of this thing, and then truth. Still scratching my head on that. Be, be, be true to the materials. Use them in the way they were intended. OK, so here's Scottish baronial uh, via Ruskin. 
These are 19th century buildings. Just look at the window size. If you want to know an old building, look at the window size. If it's that size, it ain't old. At least it's, it's uh, post-industrial revolution. So, his, one of his earliest, early, and this, this is considered his masterpiece, is the Glasgow School of Art. A, a photograph from about the time it was opened. I'm going to show you a photograph in color uh, before it burned. It's, it's now a crispy critter. But the, um, this is the entire school, takes up a whole block, sits up on a hill. So it's on the crest of the hill, and the, the lot cascades down the hill. We have uh, lit studios here between the street and the, the lower level. We're going up a set of stairs to get into the main lobby. And then massive windows and skylights. These, again, are all facing north. So we're getting really even lighting in our studios. The building is very straightforward industrial strength. So if you look at these huge windows, it's very, it's, it looks very unadorned from a distance. But don't be fooled. There's plenty of ornament in here. So if we, we'll zero in and take a closer look. This is an easy way to explain how it was built. It was built in sections. So the first, this is the first half. This is the middle. So let's go back if I can do that. Okay. So this is what we're looking at. So the, here's our anchor right on the main axis. You can see it's, it's asymmetric. So he's using, he's using asymmetry in order to balance symmetrical wings. So this section here was built first, and then this one was added about five years later. You can see a sketch from the time it was built. Here's the vacant lot that the rest of it goes on. And you get a sense of the slope, sloping nature of the site. We can pick up some uh, details here in the ironwork. The rest of this is pretty, you know, it's pretty flat, but back to that power aspect of Ruskin. And we've got some nice curving lines. So this is a really interesting interplay between something that's strength and industrial and something that's got some feminine curves and some, uh, some contrast. Here's the, the building from the other end. So here's the end wall looking down toward the middle. And then here's the complete building with the second half. So they're basically bookends around the, the front door. This is the element that, that really excited modernists. There is, there's no historical reference here at all unless you look at Scottish baronial castles with just very tall white walls. So that's, that's what people are excited about. But doesn't that look powerful? It's massive. This is going to be here forever, particularly on the downhill side. So we have, we have uh, I think it's four stories in the front. It goes to seven on the back side. So this thing is a beast of a building. And it's a uh, very, very straightforward and honest in the way the, uh, the building is massed in the decor. We've got these bays here that are cantilevered off the wall, filled with tiny paned glazed windows. So where's that coming from? Well, in England, in the arts and crafts, they're looking back to the Middle Ages, Middle Age medieval vernacular. And in the Middle Ages, you had to use blown glass. They can only blow glass so big. You know, if you've tried to blow bubble gum, it's pretty much what they're doing with the pipe. So you can only get it so big, and then you, you score it in order to create your individual paint. And to get a bigger window, you just use more lead and more glass. So that's what's being referenced here. So he is picking up some of the Middle Ages, but it looks starkly industrial and modern in this context. Here's the front door. I told you he would get the design in there. It's very flattened. There's that linear element just sort of stretching out to get down to the, the ground. A very simple door. This is interesting. He's got hinges on the middle of this post here. And the door's opening, folding toward the middle on both sides. Here's our ironwork, kind of very spiky versions of that rose we were seeing flattened out in stencil. Some, uh, some aluminum. 
he was actually, the people are experimenting with aluminum at this point. And I'll show you some of the, he, he used it as a finish for a number of his chairs. Powdered aluminum. It gave him a really nice matte finish. Okay, sorry. Some, some more metal work. You can see there's quite a lot of detail in here when you really start looking at it. But from a distance, it kind of gets swallowed up in the mass of the building. And there, there's that wall again, just rising from the street, solid wall of stone. Here's what's on the other side of the wall. This is, there is a, these tall windows are lighting the library. So there are, there's a library, there's stacks in the library. It brings in daylight into the library. And it also lights a stairwell that goes right up through the middle of the building. There's also a massive skylight on the top of the building. So although this building looks very solid, there are a lot of windows and there's a lot of light. But look again at the black. He's, he's into black again with just little bits of color. Here's a walkway between one building and the next, sort of under the skylights. Here's that staircase I was mentioning with a very interesting wire sculpture light fixture. It's coming down through the stairwell. And here's the library. So we're looking at this wing. And here's the, um, here's the middle section that we were looking at earlier. He designed all the furniture for the interior of the library as well. So you see this is very, very dark furnishings on the inside with light pouring in. And then look at the, the light fixtures. These individual globes hanging down from the ceiling. Like little, pe little pieces of jewelry. Another image in the library. Some more light fixture. A hallway in between classes. We can see some plaster Figure, figures up here for sketching. This is a mixture of skylights and then lighting features. So we're getting light coming down through that hallway. And then finally, over that massive staircase I was showing you, we've got an exposed beam of truss work under an industrial skylight. So this, there's this interesting contrast between the medieval truss work and the very frankly modern glass of the of the skylight. This looks positively medieval. It's those very low, powerful arches. Studio. North light coming in, it's bleeding into those window walls. Very tall ceilings under the gable. Director's studio. Here's the, their casework. Very flat, flush uh, doorways. Exposed light bulbs hanging straight down from the uh, ceiling. And then look at the aesthetic movement furniture. So there's, there's a really interesting play here between the power of the building and the lightness of the furniture. This is the director's room. I'm going to be showing you both walls. They, they, they've sort of, they're like bookends and they pair one another. All the white with the very dark furniture as contrast, so black and white again. Uh, here's some of the stained glass doors into the furnishings, some metal work, lighting fixtures. the other side of the room with this massive fireplace. Again, you, see, you can see more of the lighting fixtures. The rug. 
So we're, we're pulling the whole room together, getting this total look using repeating the same design elements. And here's what happened. So the, the poor building became a crispy critter in 2014, uh, pretty much gutted the library. We were there a month after the second fire. You could still smell it. So today, so they started rebuilding and then had another fire about a year ago. So when I was by there, it's all buttoned up. They, they don't know if they're going to rebuild it or not. I, I read a very interesting article uh, from a, a fairly noted critic saying, why are you trying to rebuild it? It's gone. So like, do something more modern uh, and let it go. So I don't know what, what the outcome is going to be, but today it's, it's rather sad. Okay, here's his, uh, here's the Herald building, the one of the newspaper buildings that he, he uh, designed, and it's got this really prominent tower on the corner that's totally funky, it's very, very fun. Uh, to get up in the tower, there's a circular stairway, and then there are great views up there all over the city of Glasgow. Here's another one of those little models. They're, they're easy to help understand what's happening. This is an office building and a printing plant. So it has an industrial function. Some of his drawings on the blueprints. I, I love this kind of Indian uh, feature at the top of the tower. But wait, there's more. There's a drawing. Can you pick up that feature there? That's what it looks like. It looks like an elephant's trunk. So you can sort of see some flappy ears over here. One of the, one of the um, comments that I read about him is he said, architecture should always have a sense of humor. <laughs> They're just decoration. <laughs> Why not? Next time you want to know what to do with a corner, put an elephant's trunk on it. <laughs> so here's some of the drawings from when the time, uh, at the time it was built. It does sit on a very busy corner, so you can see that tower is thinking urbanistically. It's acting as a, a, a beacon of light and truth that we know the free press always provides. And um, right on one of our main main streets, and then we have the manager's room, again, very high ceilings, the fireplace, the white furniture, blah, blah, blah. Here's the, here's the bottom of the tower. Now today, this has been turned into an art gallery and um, architect's offices. So the, this section here is very modern and has been appended to the original office. So you see a skylight there, which covers the, the top floor. And you can just get up there, you can take an elevator, you can get great views, and then take the staircase down and stop in various architectural offices. They had art galleries. There was an art show going on when I was there. And they've really taken the building and turned it into a cultural center for downtown Glasgow. So that's, that's a staircase I walked up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here's some of the, the details on the building. Don't see any more elephants' trucks in there, but you can see even the downspouts are getting treatment uh, of his hand. Here's the, here's the other um, building that he did for a paper. This one, uh, if, if you start looking at the materials, He's not using terribly modern materials. He's primarily building in stone and brick, and he's throwing in glass and metal. So it's traditional building. It's what he does with the materials that makes this stuff so interesting. So this one, he's got glazed brick in this stuff, area that's white. This is just typical stonework here, and then we've got some stone up there. So it's kind of like a stone sandwich with some white bread in the middle. 
but it's very difficult to see if you're on the street. So here's, here's a perspective view, and I'll show you what the street actually looks like. So that's, that's why you can't see this building very well. So again, if you're the owner of a building, why would you spend a lot of money on a facade you can't see? So he does, he does a pretty good job with the treatment right here at the lower level, and then just lets the rest of it be fairly simple. But even with that, there are details that are just so creative that it, you know, it, they're just surprising. So like, I love this door detail. I mean, this is crazy. He's, he's got a cantilever here holding up a bay window that's sitting on a projecting, you know, the three sort of major keystones of an arch, and then the rest of the arch is being pushed back into the building, and it's sitting on a void. And this makes no sense from a construction perspective. So if you look at this, very mannerist, the mannerist did that, and you're going like, oh, he smokes, what is he smoking? This is just totally, uh, totally unexpected. And then look at the way the materials are joining here. He's got the brick and the stone. And look how he's doing with the stone. He's treating it as though it's plastic. You've got these curved surfaces uh, coming around the corner. And then there's a lintel, this massive lintel sitting on top of this tiny little window. He's kind of squashing it. And then he's got a rose design. So you've got this, this interesting interplay between masculine and feminine uh, iconography that You'd see Mark, Margaret's got to be in there yes. somewhere. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dear, this is just too heavy. It's, it's too, and then, you know, then we've got the coining uh, feeding into the, the brick. Just masterful, masterful use of materials. Here's some other, looking up at the brick, he's even done some decorative stuff with the brickwork. So he's used other colors of glazed brick, and then he's pulled them away from the wall plane to give them some three dimensionality. Uh, using sort of a, a very simple uh, successionist style design. Another house that was designed for a competition that didn't get built until 1989. So this one is out in the park. The competition was by magazine, this is for this German interior magazine, to design a house in a thoroughly modern style where one can be lavishly entertained. So let it rip. This is what he came up with. He entered the competition and was disqualified, even though everybody thought he had the best design. So the question was, why was he disqualified? The answer is the drawings he provided were not sufficiently detailed to be able to figure out how you could build it. So they threw out his application. So the drawings were, were hanging around for a bit. Uh, back in the, the mid 80s, there was a, an entrepreneur, well actually this, this is in a city park. And there was an old building, like a medieval building in the city park that was in very bad shape. And they wanted to take it down. And they thought, well, we're going to lose this building, but in its place, why don't we build this unbuilt design by Macintosh? So they began raising funds and eventually built it. But the problem is, what did the rest of the building look like? Because he didn't have a floor plan. He didn't, there were no construction drawings. They had, to, they had to just make it up. So there are a lot of commonalities between this building and Hill House, which was, he only built two houses from scratch. So I, there's a lot of, of commonality between the two buildings, because I think they were looking at Hill House for something comparable in the same period. So here it is, this thing is massive. It's, you know, it's white. Again, we've got the, the decor focused in the center of the building. Here's the drawing that you can see something here that looks more or less like those windows that we saw at the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, or this is a little earlier design. Looks very Bauhaus. You know, sort of flat and very white. Uh, little windows. Here's again on the interior, very dark. So the entrance halls are very masculine, very high dados, very tall ceilings. These are the drawings that just 
that everybody salivated over. They were just so mind blowing. This is 1901. That um, what a fantasy! How do you how do you even build this? So, and, and I've got to think Margaret's very much in here. It's a lovely, bright, lovely pastel aspect, and then the very delicate uh, uh, decor here. So what you'll see, this here is this, this one as this was built. They were trying to figure out how do we actually do this. This is a set piece. So it's made out of wood. There's some stained glass inserted. But it's basically a screen, and then there's a piano that is stuck behind it. So, so it looks much more fancy than it is. It's actually just, just a plain old piano. Here's the keyboard. But they've got, here's, here's the, the box but they've got this element around it to give it prominence. Very tall French doors, very high ceilings. Here's what the room looks like uh, today. The furniture, you can see the proportions on the chair work with the proportions of the room, pick up some of the same elements. If you have a party, this is a party house, you can rent this out. So for your next wedding funeral or bar mitzvah, put it in. Um, you can see these gorgeous light fixtures again, the paintings on the walls, and then there are tapestries that are hung next to each of the windows that Margaret that Margaret designed. She didn't do these because she wasn't involved in this. But absolutely stunning space. Uh, here's a clock from the hall. And here is the dining room. You and one of your other friends can be enjoying dining. <laughs> and again, look at the lighting. Look at the lighting. This, this stuff's coming back, isn't it? I think this, I've seen all, some, some fixtures that, that come back. And very high data. Margaret worked on the, um, the decor here. It's, there's a program with each of these panels, just so panels, again, very dark, very masculine in the dining room, very white, very feminine in the music room. And then the master bedroom. I promised you, you would see some of the roses for stenciling. Well, here they are. And this, it, I got, you can see there's a sheen on that. That is the powdered aluminum. So they're using it like gold leaf or silver leaf. It's not as shiny as silver. And again, a, a fairly modern material. Tapestry, here's some of the needlepoint that in um, macrame, or, I'm sorry, applique that Margaret would have been doing. Stained glass inserts into the fireplace. Very simple chairs. Look at the very rectilinear furniture. Very, you know, it's very lightweight and very boxy. St. Mary's Church. This was, a, this is, now we're moving way out of town. This is the one I was telling you was close to the canal system. So when this church was built, this was an up and coming suburb in Glasgow. And it was a, an industrial area. So it was in, in the vicinity was a factory and a lot of tenement housing. And this, this sits on a very awkward site. So I'm showing you the, it, it's a very oddly shaped building and it's because of where it's located. So I think urbanistically, this is one of the most brilliant pieces I've seen anybody do anywhere. And after looking at this, I wish I could show it to some of the architects who are doing absolutely insane things in the Hoya neighborhoods. <laughs> Our community plan says transition between the old and the new and nobody bothers to transition. Let me show you what he does. It's brilliant. So here we are. Here, this is this tower is your key. This is the main street. You would be coming out of town toward this uh, suburb. This is what you would catch your eye if you're coming from town. This, as we transition around the building, we're going to pick up that. And then this is on the side street. So that each section of that tower has a different window treatment. It's yeah. It's really it's really interesting. It makes you wonder what's going on on the inside. But that's that's one of the keys that he's doing for moving you around this site. 
So here's our, here's our close-up. This is the main street. And there is a side street, or another main street, that dovetails in right at the same intersection. And then there's a side street that leads into a residential area. So this is at the a knuckle of three streets that give a really awkward intersection. So what he's done, I showed you the main drag as you were coming out of town. This is turning the corner. So he's got a nice beefy facade with that tower piece orienting toward the street if you're coming in the other direction. But then as you see, and here's, here's our main street here. Here's the tower we just looked at. You're swinging around the side, but as you go down the, the side street, which is residential, look at how he cranks the scale down. Here's the, the rectory and the Parsons house. So he makes that residential in scale. So we've got the power of the church. It's playing to the street. And as we're moving around, we're getting down to residential scale. Again, it doesn't look like a fancy building, but he manages to do some door detail that's, and window details that are pure Macintosh. So is that a leaf or is it an upside down heart? I don't know. Here's the interior. Very, very simple stained glass window. Very minimal color. This was for a this, this was for a group of what were called free Presbyterians. So they were they were very, they were like Congregationalists or Unitarians or something. But they, they were certainly doing their own thing. Very low church. So they, they wanted something very simple and very functional and not terribly expensive. So. This is what he comes up with. Gorgeous ceiling. Bent wood ceiling. We've got some huge beams there. Look at this. Isn't this one? It makes you wonder what is this niche for? I don't even know how you get up there. It's sorry, is that the tower? It yes. Yeah, it does. I mean, but there doesn't seem to be a door. It's it's the oddest feature. Yeah, it's a niche. I've got, I've got a photo of it with a chair in it. Yeah, yeah, that's a big statue. Uh, here's the pulpit. Uh, you can't quite see this real well, but this element here is that bird design I was talking about, and it's on each corner of the pulpit. Uh, and this is the, the iconography he was wishing to get out to the congregation. This is something that was important to them. And then here's this absolutely fabulous truss ceiling. A mixture of Gothic mm -hmm. truss design, medieval mm -hmm. truss design, and Japanese wiggle. It's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. Just, just. Mm -hmm. Some of the windows in very large scale with small panes that serves a semi segmental arch, the coins, just, just simple materials the plaster, the wood, the stone. Beautifully crafted together. Okay, Hill House. Um, this, this was one of two houses that he started from scratch. This is what it looked like in its heyday. Uh, 1902, again, all this stuff has been done in about a five-year period. Very, very productive and, and then flamed out. So there's that gable that we saw in the house for the art lover, the same tall battered chimney. The, the massive blank walls and the white exterior. As we you know, come around, you can see you can really pick up the Scottish baronial stair towers there. Very steep roof. 
Now, here's what it looks like today. This one, this is interesting. I, I went here, I think the week it opened, or we opened. This poor thing is melting. So what happened was he built it with conventional materials, but he had the great idea of sheathing it with Portland cement in order to keep out the elements. So this is up in a town, it's a suburb called Helensburg, which is uh, north of Glasgow. It's, it's about a half an hour train ride out. It's a commuter suburb. And it's up on a hill. That's why it's called Hill House. And they get a lot of ocean fog in rain coming off the oceans directly um, on the coast. And he thought Portland cement was a great idea to protect the building from the elements. Well, it turns out what happened was the Portland cement doesn't breathe. So it, as, the port, as the cement started to develop some wear, water got into the building between the, the wall and the cement, and it couldn't go anywhere. So it basically started rotting the house out from the inside. So when they started looking at how to treat this, they, it's, it's like Wizard of Oz, like, I'm melting, building, holding that together is the cement at this point and the cements in bad shape. So the question is, what do we do? Well, what they did was put a cage around it. This is a scaffold with a wire mesh screen, and then there's a, a metal roof on top. So the metal roof protects it from the rain, and the mesh screen cuts down the amount of moisture that is able to get to the facade. So basically, it's admitting enough moisture so the building doesn't dry out too quickly, so it cracks, it cracks the cement, but it's going to be able to dry. So it's, a, it's, it's drier than the ambient humidity, but it's not as dry as dry. And they figure it's going to take about five years for the building to be completely dry to where they can then begin to see how badly damaged it is, so they can then come up with a treatment plan. So this is a very long-term project. Uh, they got UNESCO involved. I think that I'm looking at something like a $100 million budget for starters. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, you can get in there. It's kind of interesting. I went on the website, and that you, you got a timed ticket to go, and I was worried. I, could, I couldn't contact anybody. The phones weren't working, blah, blah, blah. So I just, I, I think I finally called them. I had the concierge at the hotel call them. And the, the response was, oh, just show up. <laughs> so I showed up, and there was nobody there. <laughs> so I guess the word hadn't gotten out. This is what you see when you get up on the scaffolding. It's really fascinating. Because they, they've got uh, catwalks all over the place, and they, they've used this to do research on the property. And you get to see it from views you never get a chance to see it from. So it's, it's like totally cool. Oh, it allowed. Uh, here's the interior. These were shaped, I think these were taken before they started uh, doing the, the, the rehab. The interior here looks a lot like the house for the art lover. I yes. think they were, they were looking at the same source. Whoops. Let's go back here. Um, the interesting thing about the client here is the client wanted their own furniture. They didn't want Macintosh's total design. They said, we like your architecture, but we're bringing our stuff with us. So the house is an interesting mixture of their taste and Macintosh's taste kind of mashed together. So that's that's their dining room furniture. And this is the the owner with Macintosh's lighting. And it was the same in the living room. I think these pieces were brought in for the photo shoot because the living room has a mixture of, of the old Victorian stuff with uh, the that was that. Oh, that was Mr. Blackie. That was the owner. No, no, that's the owner. And then the bedroom. Uh, this was the owner's wife. This was her room. Uh, apparently, they had five children, and the children just had to run the house and had a bunch of dogs. 
and it was a very beloved lived-in house. But this thing is, is very white. This chair was designed specifically for the owner's wife because she would sit there uh, and, and watch the kids. She would read to them and, and um, use that as her outpost. And, and then again, look at the beautiful uh, needlework here. Willow tea rooms. Tea rooms. Why don't we have tea rooms? Why did they have tea rooms? We are in the progressive era, and women are starting to get out of the house, and they want some place to go that's respectable. So the tea room was invented so they could meet their friends, have tea, have lunch, and get out in public, and probably go shopping. So the, the tea rooms, there, there were a series of seven of them that were done for the same client by Macintosh. And he started with this one, and today this, this one was just redone. The, the place was totally gutted and completely rebuilt and opened several months ago. So it's, it's only been open for a few months. The, the research they did for all of the fittings on that was about that thick. And I, I was tempted to buy the document for all of $50, but um, it was too heavy to bring home. <laughs> but I, I was curious to see what they would have done. So, Macintosh's uh, tea room, this is the first one. This is what he started with. He started, this is another remodel. It was an 1860s tenement. And everything on the block looks like that. He said this, this got, just got swapped out. It looked like that. Again, he's using white, the rough cast plaster, to build up the facade and wipe out the Victorian design. So he completely covers it, changes the fenestration. You can see you've got big tall windows here. He's changed the level of the windows, added some very different bowed windows here, completely swapped out the front. So this gets bowed, this is bowed, this is, there's a panel here that's recessed. So he's playing with this, the, the facade as a piece of sculpture. Here's his client, Miss Cranston. She was a very entrepreneurial businesswoman. And here's the way the building comes out. Now, in looking at photographs, uh, they, this thing was fairly well photographed at the time, but it's very difficult to understand how everything relates. So I basically got rid of all the historic photographs. After having been here, I got a better idea of what's going on. And it's a very complicated uh, interior. So here's the basement. Here's the main floor. There's a stairway here that goes up to a second floor. And this space here at the front, this is where you have those long, skinny, narrow windows. That's called the Salon Deluxe. And this is the back half of the tea room with a pitched roof. This was an add-on and skylights. And there's a huge mezzanine on top of this. So this is all one space. This is accessed by the stairway. This is a separate space. There's a third floor that had a billiards room and a smoking room in it for the gentlemen of Glasgow. And then a caretaker was up in the top floor. So why were the guys here? Yeah, yeah, it's a bunch of women. What are they doing? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah, it was tea. Because prohibition was strong in Scotland. And there were a number of men who wanted some place to meet but didn't want to drink. So they could get tea and they could smoke. They weren't, they weren't opposed to smoking, but they were getting tea and they could shoot pool and shoot the breeze. So here's the original, um, original photographs. Again, total design, stained glass. They did everything down to the silverware, fireplace, gesso wall panels. Uh, we have wall hangings, the whole deal, furniture, the furniture design. And here's, here's what it looked like in its glory, the chairs, uh, 
Here's some um, stenciled window, uh, window hangings. And then here's what it looks like today. So we're standing at the back. There's a bar area here where they're preparing food. This element here is called the baldacchino. And it's a freestanding element that's, that's quite tall over two tables. You can see the tables here. They have very low chairs. But this is a massive floral arrangement. And it anchors the room. So as I started looking at the floor plan, my, my take was that this floor plan mimics a church. It's very much like a nave with an altar. We think about a baldacchino being at the altar. This is the high church of T. <laughs> and here's the baldacchino. Here's a, a light fixture here that covers uh, the, the transitional space between the front and the back. Here's the bar. Here's the staircase. There's the window from the street. Here's Miss Cranston, and here's her chair. So the chair was used as a room divider, and it was put in between the two spaces. And she would come in daily, sit at her desk, and do her accounts. And if you could take a look at her clothing, this was for her skirt. <laughs> so it was, it was short and wide for her. It was, they only did one chair of this type, specifically for his client. Here's the mezzanine in the back. So we're sort of looking through that second floor, and then the skylight's up here. Here's down below. Take a look at the tables. Macintosh was anal about the design, the layout of the tables and the chairs. So he would come into the tea room and say, no, this table needs to be at 45 degrees, and this one needs to be at 90 degrees, and these need to be aligned in this way, and whatever. Uh, and he was very particular about how the room would be set up. Salon Deluxe on the upper floor. This was where you got very expensive tea. Beautiful chandelier. This, this was totally recreated. Just amazing uh, hand-blown globules of glass uh, pieced together. It's, it's just stunning, absolutely stunning. And then here's the chairs that had the aluminum uh, finish on them. Uh, all of the stained glass. Here's that door I was showing you earlier. Same color scheme. And here's the billiards room. And a selection of Macintosh chairs. OK, the last project I'm going to look at is the Glasgow School. And this was, again, Progressive Scotland. This was for a community that was down in the industrial section right along the river. And it was for their kids. Part of the reason the Brits were interested in uh, education for their children was that they realized that they needed strong, healthy, uh, well-educated people for the army because they, they said the kids were in such bad shape, they couldn't run, they couldn't carry anything, so PE was part of the curriculum. And they also needed to be able to follow directions and you know, be good soldiers. So it had nothing to do with getting careers. It had everything to do with the British Empire and keeping, keeping the empire strong. Now, this, this building is today a museum and they have turned it into a museum of British education. So it's quite interesting. And it was in use until the late 1970s, early 80s. The reason we have it is it was part of a redevelopment area. And the mitigation for the redevelopment area was refurbishing this as a museum. So this is all that's left of, that, of what was originally in that neighborhood. To me, it looks very Richardsonian. There's a lot of stuff, that, that particularly the way these, these two turret uh, stairwells are reading and then the power of the, uh, the stonework. Here's those, uh, those segmental arches over the gateway again, and the, we saw the same type of, of um, metalwork at the Glasgow School of Art. This was a, a complex that had the caretaker on site. 
So here's where he lived. And then there was a schoolyard surrounding it. And again, there's, there's, there's uh, Macintosh's the decorative work on the end windows, although the rest of it looks fairly sleek. To me, the really interesting part of, of this was this, those stairwells. The school part, physical education was very much part of the curriculum. But the school was segregated by sex and by age. So one stairwell was for the girls, one was for the boys. And then there was a smaller entrance for infants. The staircase was the PE program. So the kids would come in, there was a two-story mezzanine. They'd come in in the morning and they would do calisthenics in the mezzanine. And then they would be marched up the staircase, up and down, in order to get their exercise. Oops. There's, there's the different entrances. You can see the marked girls, boys. So we have girls, infants, boys. Here's part of the tableaus. And here's those staircases from the inside. Always in the schoolrooms. Okay. Okay. So uh, Macintosh has this you know, intense period of creativity, lasts about 10 years. Uh, he starts sort of petering out around 1910. There's, I think his health starts to decline, and certainly there's a massive shift culturally and historically as a result of World War I. So he's just not in sync with what's going on in the 1920s, and kind of pulls into himself uh, they do move down to London, so what I'm going to show you is a, a short uh, YouTube clip uh, that talks about his major client in London, who is an industrialist named uh, Louis, uh, Bass Louis, and then from there they then go to France, and then he spends out the, the end of his life in France as a painter. Almost no work coming in, but they make attempts to start in different directions. They start designing patterns for textiles. Macintosh starts painting watercolors of flowers, rather elaborate watercolors of flowers, not like the ones he'd done earlier. Only one new patron was forthcoming during the war years, Wenwen J. Bassett Lauk, a modern-minded manufacturer of engine models and model railway locomotives. New building was out of the question in 1916, so the commission was to convert a small existing terrace house in Northampton. Bassett Lauk felt the Scotsman was on the same wavelength as himself. Mackintosh was very constricted. His brief was to provide some more living space, add a bathroom, replace the decor and furniture. Well, the Durngate House, of course, is an enormous surprise because those people who are familiar with the, the Mackintosh of the Glasgow years um, find it really quite a shock. Uh, Mackintosh in Glasgow was sensuous. You know, it's very sexy architecture you know, beautiful, sinuous, flowing lines that come from nature. Um, that was the way Macintosh made things work. It had a very beautiful kind of quality to it. And suddenly, the white on white, or white on cream and greys and browns of Glasgow disappear. And you get hard geometric shapes, diamonds, zigzags, and all done with black walls and black furniture, dark blue carpets. And all incredibly predicting what Art Deco was going to do in France in the 1920s. And of course, this is 10 years before. The guest bedroom, reconstructed in the Hunterian Art Gallery in Glasgow, shows a strong Austrian influence. George Bernard Shaw came to visit Bassett Lauk. He was asked by his host the next morning, had the room's decor interfered with his sleep? No, was Shaw's response. I always sleep with my eyes closed. <laughs> Bassett Lauk had explained to Macintosh that he was colorblind. Yellow was the only color he could distinguish. The textiles experience was allowing Macintosh to find a frame for the yellow. The days of white had long gone. 
We find it only on the exterior, at the back, where Macintosh built on a three-story bay, conceivably inspired by Bassett Lauck himself. It looks like Vienna or Berlin, but it's Northampton, circa 1917. This was Macintosh's last job. In the early 1920s, from Chelsea, his glory days appeared further and further away, a kind of dream. He wasn't able to do what he wanted most of all to do, which was to put up buildings, to furnish them, to create a whole way of life inside and around them. His vision for some artist studios in Chelsea, and later a theatre, all came to nothing. Macintosh saw little point in staying on in London, if it was just to face more indifference. <coughs> Southern France, the couple decided, would be a lot cheaper than Britain, and the Scots, anyway, have a flair for exile. Macintosh was 55, Margaret, 59. In 1923, he and MacDonald decided, I think, just to go on holiday in France, a long holiday in the middle of the south of France, where it turns around almost into Spain. And they stayed there, moving around. It's very difficult to trace exactly where they were, principally staying in, in the little port of Pont Vange. And there he paints. The Pyrenees, a hotel life, trying to speak French. He painted 41 watercolors. Sea, headlands, harbors, fortresses, villages, all more or less deserted. He freely shifted rocks and buildings about to give himself the compositions he wanted. When Margaret had to go back to London to consult doctors, Mackintosh wrote to her almost every day. He was working hard at his painting, but he sounds lost without her. There are, there's a wonderful remark in, in one of Mackintosh's letters where he says, I'm sitting here by myself at the table, he reports on having eaten at the table. She's gone, Margaret had gone back to London, and this was very unfamiliar to him, and he's writing all the time about how strange it is to do the things they do every day. They're spending hardly any mon money. He says, they put a full bottle of wine on the table uh, as if you were still here, but I've only drunk the half of it. And what he's saying to her is, look, please note, you know, I'm not drinking anymore. It's all all right. I only got as far as the Tamaria trees where I sat on my three-legged stool and tried to do three things, to read, to look about me, and to think. I know I did not read. I may have looked about me, and I know I thought, and particularly thought about you, wishing you were there also, even allowing for the fact that after 10 minutes you would declare that your delicate bum was not made to sit on and insist on moving on. I got back in good time and had a good lunch, a lamb cutlet and a lamb kidney. You would have enjoyed that. Macintosh was earning less than a navvy for his paintings, but now he could control his anger about that. So be it. In your last letter, I hear a little cry, as if you were tired of being alone. Well, Margaret, I have hated being alone all the time. Nothing is the same when you are not here. Everything has a flatness. I feel as if I was waiting for something all the time, and that is true because I am waiting for you. Dear Margaret, it will not be long now until we meet again. The paintings are placid. The visible is refined to a kind of design, nature redesigned, an abstract harmony. Macintosh had transmuted his sadness into a declaration of love for Margaret, for his surroundings, for his art. I think what we've learned from Macintosh is an absolute belief in beauty. 
the significance of environments that are in themselves beautiful, fantastically crafted, beautifully designed, the significance they have on human life, that they can improve the quality of the way that your life works for you. What you do have is constantly the celebration of Macintosh. You have a reputation which has grown and grown and grown ever since he died, and which now, if he were to come back, it would astonish him. It would absolutely astonish him. And whether he would recognize himself, I'm not sure. It's easy to look back at Macintosh as the rejected genius, the master builder disowned by his own folk. It's an overstatement of what happened, but it allows each generation to try and discover Macintosh for itself. We interpret his virtues to suit our own age. And so it is that the buildings appear perennially fresh to us, as modern as the day, as if we had just woken up to discover them there. After his four years in France, a lump had appeared on Toshi's tongue, so they returned to London to have it examined. The diagnosis was cancer of the tongue, all that stinging hot local tobacco. He was taken into hospital. His tongue was removed. When Macintosh came out of hospital, he was wearing a radium collar. An old friend, the dancer Margaret Morris, found them rooms in a house in Hampstead, which had a garden. A garden with a willow tree. Macintosh sat under the tree, and it was Margaret Morris who patiently coaxed him to try speaking. He couldn't speak, and instead she sat holding his hand in the shade of the willow tree. Macintosh died in London in December 1928. His ashes were scattered over the Mediterranean from one of those rocks he painted. Margaret MacDonald Macintosh lived on for another four years. Oh well. Oh well. The internet is getting really nasty with ads. So, any questions, comments? Uh, oh, the, the movie that I was showing you, you can find it on YouTube. It's about an hour long. And, uh, you know, just look up Charles Rennie Macintosh. And, yeah, it's a terrific film. And um, I, I was surprised when I was at the Macintosh Society headquarters at the church I showed you, they had the film and the visitors' things, and they were selling it. So I guess that is the latest thing on Macintosh. And this, is, this was done a while back. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a really lovely suitcase. Okay. Oh, we have a couple of presentations. First, we have the life oh. of Louis Kahn. Yay, Louis Kahn. And uh, this book I just just came out this week that I did for the UT, the second of the San Diego Memories Picture History books. This is the 1940s and 50s, and I actually bought copies if anybody wants to buy a copy today. Excellent. 20 bucks at least for you also. Well, thank you. Did you sign it? Yes, I did. Thank you. So thank you very much. So much. And